Good evening again, BST alumni, students, staff, faculty, board members, and guests. I'm delighted you have joined us for this first ever virtual alumni gathering. My name is Angie Barker Jackson, and I'm the Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at BST. As we prepare to begin our panel discussion, I'm going to take a moment of privilege um, so that I can say thank you publicly to President Brenneman, Dean Flesher, and Trustee Chair Choi Wong for their presence and participation today. We're grateful that you spent some of this extra day that you got this year with all of us. Also, I want to give a big shout out to the members of the advancement team and other staff for their roles in today's program. Reverend Sylvia Britt, thank you for offering our opening prayer. Dr. Hannah Kang, thank you for running the Zoom room. We couldn't have done that without you. Ms. Leah Rochill, thank you for being willing to offer our closing prayer in just a little while. Reverend Sam Fielder, thank you for creating graphics and visuals for use in our marketing and promotion of this program. And finally, thank you, Ms. Melissa LaBeouf for being my partner in dreaming this event into existence and then managing all those pesky details to get us to this place. Thank you all very much. For the next hour or so, we are going to consider the topic of connection and ask some big questions about creating meaningful relationships in our faith communities and ministry contexts. My guests this evening are four stellar Berkeley School of Theology alums. Reverend Vikia Brinkley graduated in 2013 with her master's in community leadership and is currently pursuing a doctor of ministry. Yay for that. She is senior pastor at True Faith Community Baptist Church in Antioch and also serves as the first vice president of the Progressive National Baptist Convention of the Southwest Region and is the first woman to hold this elected position in the entire history of the convention. So let's give her a round of applause there. That's awesome. Vikia's dissertation research examines how preaching social justice may inform and empower communities with the solutions needed to rebuild power structures and be better advocates. That sounds awesome. Also with me tonight is Reverend Dr. Barbara Jim George, who graduated in 2010 with her Master of Divinity and in 2014 with her Doctor of Ministry, both with honors. She serves as executive pastor for the True Faith Community Baptist Church in Antioch and is dean of its Ministers and Lay Leaders Development Institute. In addition to having been recently elected as assistant dean of the Congress, of Christian Education at the Progressive National Baptist Convention's Southwest Regions Conference in Vegas, Barbara has served at all three board levels for the American Baptist Church's USA Ministers Council. Next, Reverend Paul Schneider is a lifelong American Baptist, graduated in 2017 with his Master of Divinity and is a current doctoral student here at BC. He is Associate Executive Minister of Operations and Administration of the Evergreen Baptist Association and is also the founder and director of the OASIS Project, which creates inclusive spaces for rest, recharge, and renewal at conventions, conferences, and festivals. If you're one of those people that goes to Comic-Con and things like that, you need to get to know Paul um, because he has a heart for folks like you. His doctoral work is focused on developing a theology and ethic of pop culture. Very fun. And finally, Reverend Dr. Marguerite Belui graduated from BST in 2021 with her Doctor of Ministry degree. She is the family life and discipleship pastor at Santa Clara First Baptist Church. Marguerite is also an affiliate faculty here at BST and teaches courses in ministry and technology. Recently, she became the very first woman to have her ordination recognized in her home Baptist Church Association 
And that, that recognition happened on December 29th, 2023 at a celebration in Manipur, India. So it was 17 years in the making, but we celebrate with Marguerite on that recognition of her ordination and vocational call. Before we begin the discussion, here is some background to set the stage for us. Last year in May of 2023, the United States Surgeon General released a report calling loneliness and isolation an epidemic in America. According to the Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, our epidemic of loneliness and isolation has been an underappreciated public health crisis harming individual and societal health. Our relationships are a source of healing and well being, hiding in plain sight, one that can help us live healthier, more fulfilled, and more productive lives. Given the significant health consequences of loneliness and isolation, we must prioritize building social connection the same way we have prioritized other critical public health issues such as tobacco, obesity, and substance use disorders. Together, he says, we can build a country that's healthier, more resilient, less lonely, and more connected. Also a part of his report were these consequences of poor or insufficient connection in our lives. If we're insufficiently connected, we have a 29% increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia as older adults. They're staggering statistics. And the Surgeon General has recommended um, several things um, to us as a people, and they include strengthening our social infrastructure, enacting crow connection public policies, mobilizing the health sector to address these needs, reforming digital environments to evaluate our relationship with technology here as we're sitting on technology, deepening, deepening our knowledge through more robust research, and finally, the one we have really come to talk about cultivating a culture of connection. And that's what we want to talk about. I hope by the conclusion of our time together, we will have fostered a sense of hope and encouragement about the possibilities for deep and meaningful connection um, in our families and our faith communities. Um, and then of course, in the wider world. So my first um, question or questions for the panelists um, are kind of um, a pair of questions. They're opposite sides of a coin, if you will. I'm curious about um, what you all think the biggest barriers or challenges to meaningful connection are in today's faith community. So in your churches, in your ministries. And then after we think about that for a little bit, let's think together about how you all are mitigating or overcoming those challenges um, in your context. So I hope the panelists are all unmuted. Um, we have not rehearsed. We are um, praying for an organic conversation and look forward to you all um, joining that with questions in a little bit as well. So panelists, the biggest barriers or challenges that you see to meaningful connection in your context, in your faith communities. Don't be shy. Somebody has to break the ice and go first. <laughs> I, I see it on two fronts. I see the disconnect between um, those who are severely marginalized, meaning they are homeless, uh, they're in positions where they have no way to take care of their, their bodily needs, their, their physical needs. And too often people, they, they, they look at them, but they don't see them. I used to have an office above uh, Broadway and 12th street in Oakland and Broadway and 11th street. And at lunchtime, I look out the window and there were people, there used to be an abutment for BART right there, but they took that down. And 
people who were in the house would sit on, sit around that thing. And sometimes people would sit flat on the pavement with their legs sticking out. And I watched people walking by, they saw them, but they would not allow themselves to focus their eyes on them. Mm. You know, and I thought, I get it. What you don't, what you won't allow yourself to see, you yeah. don't have to feel any kind of guilt in trying to mitigate that or do anything about it. So it was like the guy had his legs sticking out. The lady walked over him just like she might have stepped over some chewed gum. Mm. So there's that factor of, you know, our mission is beyond the walls of the church. So there's that factor of severely uh, marginalized people, unhoused people. But there's also the factor of loneliness within the congregation. Some people can be in a congregation or any crowd and feel lonely. They may not be making the connections with other people. And also when we, we see people coming to worship, you know, they may be dressed well, they may look normal and everything, but we don't know the inner thing that's going on. We don't know that they may be suffering from such loneliness or have such issues that they're the ones that may be abjectly poor and what they're doing, they're reading their Bibles from the margin mm -hmm. or they may have such pain that is in the title of a book we, we used in the Institute. They may be hiding behind the cross, wondering if the, the vast expanse of God's mercy and grace extends to them. So there are a lot of things we don't know, but if we operate, no matter what, if we operate from a position of love, you know, actually really loving our neighbors as ourselves, doesn't matter if they're dirty, you can shake their hands, you can go home and wash your hands, but not having that human touch, which was part of why COVID was so tragic. You couldn't hug people, you couldn't touch them and tell them, it's going to get better. You couldn't even sit by your loved ones and hold their hands as they transitioned. The human touch is very necessary. And I think it was in the early 50s, there was a, a an experiment in Argentina or somewhere in South America. They had so many orphans that the nurses could not tend to each one. They only had time to prop a bottle up and change a diaper. So they started looking at the rates of mental health issues among these babies. The ones that had special needs and got held and cuddled, they did fine. But the ones who did not experience that human touch were all either severely retarded or mentally disabled, or they died. And the report was based upon the concept that human beings need to be touched. Babies have to be held or they will not survive. Same way with the animals, all mammals. So, you know, that's my take on how important those connections are. Thank you, Barbara. Oh, and I, I really appreciate you bringing out the, um, how people can be lonely even in a crowd. Oh yeah. Um, or even in what we think is a community. So that's really something for us to think about over the next little bit. And I heard somebody else jumping in. So sorry, I cut you off. Oh, that's okay. No, no worries at all. Um, so I uh, just, one of the things that I noticed during the pandemic was as we were all using Zoom and, and these other technologies that allowed us to stay at least somewhat connected, mm -hmm. um, I noticed something over time that uh, I will call the social media effect. And I want you to all think about your social media profiles um, or, or, or the way that you present yourself on the internet. You present yourself in a very particular way. As a rule, people tend to present themselves in the best possible light. They shape their image on the mm -hmm. internet. It, it can be a deeply inauthentic space. Some people are much more open, and, 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 but even so, they're still shaping. They're cultivating an image as they do so. I noticed that early on in using Zoom, people would be in their spaces as they were. And very quickly what happened, uh, I saw it in the church that I was pastoring at the time, was that the area for Zoom would suddenly become clean. <laughs> and or, or, or they'd, they'd, they'd choose the place that they were sitting so that they were presenting, again, a particular image. Once the digital backgrounds became an option that people could do, people would put up these backgrounds that they thought were, you know, indicative of, of who they were, right? And, and, and again, um, 
point of it was to present a very particular image, to present a, a, a front, if you will. And sometimes that front gets in the way of authentic relationship and genuine mm -hmm. connection. And, and even now that churches are beginning to gather together again, right, um, are doing these hybrid services where some of it's online, some of it's in person, whatever it might be, these fronts that are so carefully constructed are not something that people are willing to let go of. Mm. And so I think that can get in the way of connection as well. Yeah. Wow. That's something. I would sure. like to comment there, Paul, if I might. Please um, do. Yeah, thank you. Great, great segue. I was thinking about that as um, Reverend Dr. BJ was speaking about this uh, deep research that I think some of us have done around this notion of connection and human touch mm. and having to kind of circle back to that uh, in a space where we were forced to relinquish human touch because of COVID um, and, and having to think of different, different means of staying connected. Um, and and I, I thought about this place where what is, what does connection mean and what, and what does it mean for different populations? Uh, in this traditional space, I'll use the word for lack of a better one, um, in the Black community, what the church has meant um, when we related to the word connection. It was a place to um, to gather together, not only socially, but to exchange commerce, to exchange food, to exchange um, uh, information, ideas, and resources. And you know, there's a, a shift in the society as to what that meant. But I have lots of conversations with, um, what do we refer to millennials, right? Who, for <laughs> them, the word connection means something totally different. Yeah. And then tying it back to um, their relating to me that this space where we're using Zoom and using electronic means as a primary form of connection is satisfactory for them, right? Um, however, when you look at it in a different demographic and you look at seniors, um, less so, because it is more important to them that they actually touch you, they actually see you, they actually have an opportunity to break bread together. And it was already moving toward that, uh, that direction as a society that we were getting away from that actual thing and getting away and getting into other means of connection um, that didn't mean physically coming together, actually eating, you know, partaking in each other's food um, and getting to know each other in that way. And so, um, again, as a researcher, I started to, to think about it deeply and, and was forced to do it as a pastor in thinking about how do we maintain connections if I can't bring people together? We're not having an in-person service. Uh, we're not coming together in these small group gatherings where we were able to build relationships. Um, I, I'm a cook and many people in, in our, and I just believe in a lot of, of food activities and a lot of, <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of food connection. And so when you take those core things away, now, how are we still connecting? And one of the main things that I will say with the seniors that they say all the time is I'm lonely. I, I appreciate the worship service. Some of them shifted. For some, it was a great thing because they had physically become um, unable to attend worship experiences as they've always been able to. And so it was a great thing. Uh, some of those that I talked to who are now even in their 90s to say, I, I still am, am connected to my church because I can hear my pastor preaching. However, uh, one of the things that we have to attend to all the time is this profound sense of being disconnected um, because if they don't log in on Sunday, it's not uh, the same as if somebody notices, I haven't seen you at church in weeks and weeks. And so they feel this sense of disconnect with the church community because if they don't log in, who cares? Who's who's going to call them, right? Um, so just thinking about that in terms of uh, what is our segue to our, to our next? When we try to connect via Zoom, we try to connect in these other social media platforms. We try to connect in other electronic means. Um, and you touched on something really important too, Paul, when you said uh, we've leaned into these places where the filter is king, right? <laughs> I would never dare come on camera without this, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> built to replace this facade and thinking about how I want to present myself. Uh, we changed our backgrounds because um, even from uh, my HR hat flies on for a minute and we counseled people and said, hey, that's a distraction that I can see your your stuff behind you. Um, but we we used that um, to really encourage people to put this facade together of the way that they wanted to present and then having to realize that we're really not seeing our true selves sometimes in the social media space, even on Zoom, because we're, we're very uh, intentional about, let me think what I want you to really see about uh, about me, what I want you to think about me. Um, which background shall I use that will say, I am this pious, you know, I'm, I'm this person. Um, so I think for me, it's been a, a season of really being very intentional and contemplating what does connection mean to different people, depending upon who I'm talking to, connection means something different. Uh, and so that's been a, a, an entry place for me to think about what are the solutions? Well, it depends who I'm trying to connect to. Thank you, Vakia. That is really helpful. Several things we're gonna come back to as we, this conversation kind of iterates. Um, Marguerite, did you want to share? I think what you're yeah, I think we're touching big on um, technology and social media, you know, and when you open up your social media, it's like visiting 10 to 20 different countries, you know, because you see at least 10 to 20 of your friends vacationing. Uh, they're having a great life, right? And then, well, my life sucks, you know. <laughs> uh, um, and as a as a um, minister, when I go to places, how am I providing uh, value by posting the things I post? You know, how am I representing the Christ or the gospel um, by posting what I post? You know, so as somebody who teach um, technology, that is a challenge. You know, because I think we it, it, we're more challenged because we see the. Uh, the danger behind it, you know, that uh, we can project a lot of ourselves. So looking from the minister's point of view, um, I think we need leaders now who can um, present an authentic self, uh, like Vicky and Paul has mentioned, um, be Christ, you know, so, and that is very, that is very hard. Um, uh, so, how do we balance, you know, uh, being a messenger of Christ while at the same time being the, and that's very hard. You have thousands, each of us have hundreds or thousands of friends. Um, um, and the question is, what are the barriers to deep, meaningful con uh, connection, right? Your NGO question. Can we really have deep connection through what we think we're doing, you know? And I think we have to really, uh, self introspect and ask honestly, um, and find each of us will find an answer to that, you know, and it will be different level of, um, you know, throwing it out in the in the air because uh, you don't know who looks at your post. So mm -hmm. um, I think um, this is a mitigation part of how do I want to project myself as a leader and be the be the messenger of good news, or am I making other people more depressed by my um, by my great life? You know, so um, I think we have to learn to be authentic and ask ourselves why am I doing what I'm what I'm doing? You know, um, in terms of connection, I think that's just a small part. Um, the culture that I'm in, uh, it's a culture of uh, busy. You know, uh, I was just asking Reverend Katie, do you feel, do you feel more free after being retired? And we, we, we talk about, I've seen a lot of busy retired people, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, busyness can be an excuse to deep connection. You know, how are you? You are, somebody asks you, I'm busy because I'm not ready for conversation. I'm not ready for connection. 
But if we're ready to come to church or in the community open space, maybe we have to prepare ourselves to go out in the open. And so there again, there is a need for self-introspection. Okay, if I'm committed to come to a meeting, am I ready for the connection, right? Uh, if I'm ready, if I'm wanting to post something, am I ready for the connection and the interaction that comes with it? So that's one thing. Um, uh, the third thing is we... The culture I'm I'm in it's uh, it's a culture of worry and hurry, you know. Mm -hmm. We get things done. We are so big on, uh, we're very performance oriented and so big on productivity. You know, we want to get the most amount of things done, uh, in the least amount of time, which means we are not ready for personal human connection because I have to get my job done. I have to get the sermon done. I have to get my lesson plan done. I have to get this project out. So sometimes we forget to interact while getting ready for that project, you know? So uh, for me, as I was uh, reflecting on this question, what comes in the way of meaningful connection? For me, it's, um, am I really authentic with myself? Uh, am I really authentic to my calling of being a good uh, messenger of good news? The second one is uh, uh, being busy, you know, the excuse of being busy and how do I, um, how do I uh, pause from that? And the third one is the culture of uh, worry and hurry. Uh, maybe because we're not relying totally on God and mm. we think that it's us who's going to produce the result. Maybe uh, we have to expect God to be the God of the harvest at the end of the day. So those are the three main thing comes to mind. Thank you, Marguerite. I want to pull a few things that you all said there as barriers and challenges and think together about how we can mitigate those or overcome them. And some of you have hinted at that, especially Marguerite, you started hinting at um, overcoming those. So um, I see um, kind of uh, integration with what Paul mentioned as, you know, us curating our own images mm. um, in, in front of people um, and how those facades that we create can get in the way of authentic connection um, and our hesitation maybe to, to let the, our guard down and, and let those fall very connected to Marguerite talking about um, presenting an authentic self and um, trying to figure out the balance on um, places like the internet and social media. Um, I heard Vikia, your mention of food and how important food is with connection. And I mean, I, I, sharing food is a gospel thing, right? This is, mm -hmm. this is, this is a very gospel thing to share food around the table um, and how that's still a challenge. Um, I, I know people even um, to this day in our, even as we've moved, you know, out of um, COVID as a pandemic and are learning to live with it. Um, I still know quite a few people that that won't eat food prepared by others because of kind of stigmas around that. You know what I mean? We weren't allowed to share food, if you will, during the pandemic and things. And so that's still, you know, hard to kind of return to a food sharing sort of communal experience. Um, that's also related to, you know, Barbara talking about um, the absence of human touch and um, our like averting our eyes even um, mm -hmm. and not seeing seeing people so um what are how, how do we mitigate some of those things and and overcome them i know some of you were hinting at them and um didn't kind of go full on into those things but um let's think about that a little bit in particular i'm really curious about people's thoughts um on being in ministry and presenting an authentic self um and how how do we balance authenticity again over and against oversharing or unboundaried you know behavior um things like that so somebody jump in and and uh share a little bit about that yeah i heard of a phrase that stuck out to me that was talking about um in ministry having this need for being for transparency in intimacy 
and I had to kind of step back and what what are, what is that talking about? It, it really sharing for a person for me who is an oversharer, um, and and building in this cautionary wall around um, being too transparent and um, not having this space of boundaries where you're just telling everybody every little everything about yourself. And whether or not uh, as a pastor, as a, as a mentor, as a, as a teacher, where the line is in that, where you keep some things um, so that people can uh, remain focused on Christ and not on me, right? If I start oversharing, they go, well, wait a minute, let me, let me um, assess your worthiness to be able to do that because your, you know, your humanity is sticking out. Uh -huh. Um, so I think there's a place where there, it leans into this place of being very guarded in social media for that reason and thinking about what we post, what we say, um, uh, because we want to be authentic. We want to share, but at the same time, um, this whole phenomena of being able to accidentally go viral with something that for you was, was small and how society can take a small thing and blow it into all out of proportion and you don't get an opportunity to uh, to speak to it, to rebut. Um, and I think it becomes a place of, um, of caution where we have to lean into the tool of social media, into Zoom and all these other places, but we also have to think about the word boundary, um, healthy boundaries, right? And how much we share, how much we don't share, um, how much we expose, how much we um, don't expose. And I like to think that we think about this place of not wanting to overexpose, not from a place of wanting to be cloaked, but from a place of thinking about, I don't want to take away from um, the Christ focus here and have the attention shift to to me mm. and and, you know, who I am as opposed to the one that I'm speaking about. So I, I think about that in terms of what we were just, uh, you know, discussing. Um, I'm, I'm also an instructor of social media and also uh, on the on my bivocational side, my my charge and challenge in organizations is, is coming in and building culture in the organization and building the connections with people and building intact teams. And so it looks very different from what it looked a few years ago. Right. Where um, I'm experiencing it, many people are where the person that I report into is 20 years younger than I am. And so when they say connection, they're talking about something else. Um, they're talk. they have a different expectation and outcome from what I would organically say. Here's how we connect. Here's how we build here. Here's how we take care of the people. So I, I think for me, especially when I shifted over to what am I talking about in ministry? And talking to pastors, there's this hesitation around connection that may lead to an overexposure, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so just wanted to insert that at, at that point in the conversation and thinking about together with us, um, th this place where we want to hold a few things still in, you know, in private if we can, and it, that's becoming increasingly difficult to do. appreciate that, Bakia. You're talking about that reminded me um, of a course that I took when I was doing my doctoral work called Vulnerable Leadership. And the professor kind of navigated that topic in this way and talked about how, because um, we were talking about the lines between, as ministry leaders, the line between, you know, appropriate authenticity and, you know, the oversharing unboundaried, you know, um, kind of nature of things. And, and she talked about how used a metaphor of um, inviting people to our home or how um, people that we knew might come to our home, that there are some people that um, we just wave to from the porch, right? They walk by on the sidewalk and we just <laughs> wave to them. And that's the level of relationship that we have. And we have other people that, that come to our homes and sit on the porch with us. And so they're a little bit closer and we, we expose ourselves a little bit more. And we have others that, that we invite into the living room. And, you know, we let them a little bit closer. Um, and, and there are others that we might 
have come sit in our kitchen at our table, you know, into the heart of our home, into the heart of our life. And to think about as pastoral leaders, um, where kind of, you know, our interactions with people are those, you know, sidewalk people, are they porch people, are they living room people, you know, are they heart of the home kitchen people and kind of using that metaphor, um, which I thought was, um, was kind of really helpful. So thank you for your thoughts about that too. Um, who else? I see, I see some of your library, uh, for those who are not using filter, <laughs> some of your library, I see your bedroom, I see your living room, you know, uh, that's what we see at Zoom, right? And uh, many, some of us are bold enough to post it online with our hundreds of uh, friends. And I want to connect that, connect this with uh, Reverend Katie's, uh, how do you find authentic connection outside your congregation, you know, and it's in the small groups or in prayer time that I catch my church members. We catch each other's. This is the prayer we need, right? That's where the authenticity come in, like the vulnerability, the rawness. Um, and then we present this another identity. And there's a bit of bipolarness in all of us, you know, because our church member sees us as one thing. And then the people we present online or even in a Zoom, your classmate who have never walked into your house or have never had in-person uh, connection with you in small group, they see another personality. And I think the challenge is, can we find a balance or do we just keep that boundary, you know, and uh, uh, what personality am I, who am I in the midst of this? You know, I think that's a question for me and for all of us. Um, but going back again to Reverend Katie's, um, I still have, I don't know, she's been in ministry longer, so she'll know. For me, I still have friends from Midwest, the, the people that have uh, uh, um, have been very intentional in making deep connection, right? And I forget most of them, 90% of them. So it depends on the investment I put into that relationship. Although we have to be careful as ministers that, as we interact with them, that they don't find partiality from us, right? But definitely I've seen um, some relationship stand the test of time. I don't know about you. Thank you. I think I think those relationships that have stood the test of time are really important. I mean, uh, there was, there was a, you know, a, Having appropriate boundaries with our congregation is is an ethical necessity um, for for us as pastors, um, and that's why collegial groups I think are so important. Here are other people who are also uh, pastors, other ministers, other faith leaders who are facing some of those same challenges, and you can you can reveal your struggles with them. You can ask them for advice. They can be people you trust. But I think it's also really critical that we have people who we can just be our authentic, messy selves with. Um, and and I think that that there are reasons why that should not be the people in our congregations. Um, and I'm, you know, grateful for, uh, you know, I've got friends who I've been friends with for uh, going on 30 years now. And, you know, they've been there for the good and the bad. Right. They, they 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 know me at my best and they know me at my worst and they still choose to hang out with me. Thanks be to God. Um, and and I'm so grateful that I have those people who I can have that kind of authenticity with um, who who lean on one another and support one another. And I think that us having that support and developing those relationships with friends, with with colleagues, um, then allows us to come in and model being that support in our congregations and maybe encourage within the congregations them to be that kind of support for one another. Because we can absolutely support our congregants in that, but just like it's inappropriate for a parent to uh, dump on their child some of their emotional trauma and damage, it's not appropriate for pastors to do with their congregants either. Um, those boundaries are, are again, important to maintain, even though it can go the other way, right? Even though we can be that support for someone when they're really struggling. Um, so there is a tension there. Um, 
But I think tension is a big part of what pastors have to live into every day. So good. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Angie, may I respond to something I'm seeing in the chat? Sure. Go ahead, Vikia. Yeah. Um, I see here. Thank you for your, your dropping that into here. Uh, Jim says the way we tell it and um, ask about this, reflecting a bit on the nature of cultural differences, especially intergenerational and also a tag from Marie, who's talking about this conversation that we're having around mental health and um, communication and connection and interestingly, I was just having this conversation, uh, thinking about this intergenerational meaning of connection and um, sharing. Uh, and some of the folks who are my age and above say that it was absolutely cultural that certain things were not shared. You know, we we just, it was kind of a known thing in families that we, we knew kind of how this went down, but there was not this... Um, uh, sharing in terms of storytelling. Uh, and, and, and again, what does the word authentic mean? For them, authentic meant I'm not going to share everything because I'm actually being kind to you by covering some things and not telling exactly what happened. Some things came out upon the death of a relative. You know, there are three paths and everybody's t telling all these stories. But um, I, I appreciated pulling the word authentic into that and thinking about what authentic means um, culturally and thinking about what it means in terms of generations. Um, where, you know, my my observation, again, is that uh, folks who are a little bit younger are, are more apt to, uh, as we would use that lingo, speak their business. And folks are, you know, I'm not talking my business. I don't know you, you know, and thinking about it in that way. But I really appreciated this writing that you dropped in there because it was saying when what you expose, we clothe, right? Um, what you divulge, we swallow. And so that is also a part of the challenge of when you ask the question, what are we doing about a uh, doing about it in terms of connection, in terms of communication, um, and what it really means? We can't do the work until we actually think about what the word connection means from generation to generation. We can't do the work unless we think about who who am I talking to right now and what does that mean to them and what do they need, mm. right? Um, we just, connection means something very, very different in what we need and how we can fix the problem. And I think about that in terms of always cautioning ourselves not to sit as we do with other social concerns sit from Mount Olympus and say, we've thought about it. We've, we, we had a whole think tank. We know exactly what to do, right? Without engaging the voices of the people that we're trying to serve. Um, and so I think it would be very difficult to have this um, solution-based thing that is not intercultural, that is not intergenerational, mm -hmm. and to think about what the solutions are that would be effective in connection. It mean it just means something very different to people, and you can't fix it unless you say, "What does it mean for you?" And even talking about loneliness, what does loneliness mean for you? For some people, they don't want me to stop by their house with my casserole and my chicken. They're like, <laughs> "You're my space." For other people, um, they they want the personal. They miss that. They want somebody to come by, they want something tangible that they can touch, they can feel, they can eat. Um, millennials tell me, pastor, don't call me, please. We, you know, I'm young, we text, don't, you know, I don't want to be chatting with you on the phone. And so I have to understand that and hear that and not hear that as I don't want to talk to you right. or I'm trying to um, hide myself from you. They're just saying, I don't, that, that's not what I need to feel connected to you. If you would just drop a heart on my page or if you would just send me a text message, I'm I'm good right there, right? Um, however, some of my seniors say, I actually detested when you text me. I don't even know if I'm part of a group text. One of my seniors said, I don't like you to put me out there on social media. We weren't on social media. It was a text thread. But for them, they were like, I, oh, 
it was like putting them on the news. Like, what are you doing? I'm going to, other people are hearing my conversation. So I think we can't really talk about solutions unless we think about what the word connection means to the audience that we're speaking to at the moment and what do they need in terms of connection. Yeah. Lots, lots of deep listening to figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. Paying attention. Um, Katie Choi Wong has kind of pressed that even further, right? And how do you do that in multicultural, cross-cultural settings? Um, those of you that are on the panel, um, Vicki has just mentioned intergenerationally how she's paying attention and um, connecting with people in their preferred kind of uh, modes of connecting based on maybe their age cohort. What about um, diversity of, of culture? Um, how are you all taking different approaches or have you had opportunity to take different approaches um, in those sorts of settings, multicultural, intercultural settings? Hold it. Okay, uh, I was going to say Evergreen's diverse. I'm waiting on you. <laughs> this is one of my growing edges, right? Is because I grew up in, in a very specific church context. Most of my churching has been in those church contexts. Um, in and, and that is kind of the white Protestant mainstream church context. Mm. And so when I tend to think of church, even though I know that it exists in other very vibrant and real forms, there is sort of a, a way that I think about church. And one of the blessings of the position that I'm in is that I get to go and find out what church is for other people and what that connection looks like in those spaces and, and not just rest on my assumptions about what sufficient connection is and really ask those questions. You know, um, uh, one of, the, one of the, the things that I'd been doing as I was beginning to connect with, with our churches more, I'd been um, the pastor of a church uh, as well as my role with the region up until the end of the year. And so my Sundays were constrained, right? I <laughs> had a place I had to be, but now my Sundays are free. Um, and so I have started attending other congregations and, and, and worshiping with them. And as I'm going around, um, I'm learning that there are some, there are some, in fact, unspoken rules, you know, some, sometimes I reach out to say, hey, I'm going to be there. And, and I get a response back that's sort of like, that's fine. Why are you, why are you telling me? And then others are very grateful for the heads up, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's just a difference in culture, a difference in personality, a difference in approach and style. And and so I think that's one of the things that we learn as as pastors. Uh, one of the things I learned, you know, uh, at BST um, from Reverend Dr. Peter Clark is, is you know, you, you do your work with the person who's in front of you right then. Mm -hmm. Not not the person as you've built them in your head, not not the person you wish you were talking to, but the person who's actually in front of you. Right. And, and that that's a really important part of, of doing that. And so that means being open to learning and changing and growing um, and, and, and also letting go of the assumption that your way is the right way, um, which especially as a white person is something that I struggle with all the time. Thank you, Paul. That was really, yeah, really, really good. That was good. I just want to make a comment, um, if I if if I may. It's like you got to meet the person where they are, not where you are, and it's based on their values, not your values. Uh, I think that's really important. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Any of the other panelists want to jump in on the multicultural, cross-cultural connection piece? I was in a cross-cultural relationship because my ex-husband is Nigerian, but 
there were there weren't really any cultural clashes because as far as worship well allen temple used to have an eight o'clock and an 11 o'clock service so we would go to allen temple at eight o'clock and then go to his church at 11. and that worked out fine until um his pastor did something that really just insulted my husband and he said we're going and we're not coming back they took exception to because i was not a member they took exception to me of all things sharing communion which i'm like well it's okay don't you know don't trip about it no you guys have welcomed me at allen temple i participate in everything they act like i'm a lost relative when i i come in you know everybody's happy to see me and i bring you to my church and my pastor's going to act like this i said it's it's really not a thing for me I'm only coming here because I'm with you. It's, I mean, I know the church was there, but it's not some place that I've been longing to get in. It's just a church. So, um, you know, we, we got along pretty well in that regard because he liked Allen Temple more than that much smaller church anyway. Um, there were some cultural differences in terms of the their family life, things they did. And it weren't so much differences. They were familiar spaces because a lot of things they still do are things that early hebrews and israelites did and we have conversation and i said wait a minute wait 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 you do this you guys did this in nigeria he said yeah well i said that's what they did in the old testament of the bible and it would just blow my mind but um there were no issues as far as cross-culturalism and maybe it's because alan temple always was a a culturally diverse church. We had so many Hispanics that they actually formed their own congregation and went on to plant churches all over Central America. There was a, a African, um, not a committee, but a small group of people from different parts of Africa. So I was used to that. So if I could just uh, push Dr. Marguerite, because I know you have in Silicon Valley, I'm, I'm blown away by the international, intercultural, you have one of those pr premier examples. And here you are, you and uh, Wong from India leading such a, a divert, and I'm speaking cult culturally and just the range in terms of Silicon Valley types. <laughs> How do you, um stay connected in your church because you have such a vibrant growing congregation. 40 percent wide right and um we were in the midwest for 15 years that's where we learned to be wide <laughs> <laughs> that would be very offensive to my Asian <laughs> brothers and sisters like traitor you know uh, we call white asians right but the first meal I was invited to my first year of, um, of the U.S., you know, when I first came in, in Chicago was they gave us bratwurst for dinner. So we came back home and cooked rice. <laughs> that was not a meal for us, you know, so probably the casserole might not work. But I think Barbara uh, appointed, like, um, you have to meet them where they are. So if you're white, uh, congregation member is sick, then probably we really have to asking is is a good leeway to what do you need, you know, mm -hmm. and it may be a different need for, so not assuming that my need is their need. I think I've learned that because, and my mother-in-law does the same, you know, we go for dinner at other people's house and she'll still come back and cook because we need to end the day with rice. Um, so I think food comes to mind. Food is, is, is a big part of culture. So when we do visitation uh, of a sick member, what kind of food do we take it to them, right? So um, that would be a good place to start to kind of break the cultural ice. Um, I also remember in one of the Asian gatherings, Ken Fong was a speaker uh, 15 years ago. Um, being intentional if you are leaning towards multicultural, being intentional of optics. 
who are on the stage, you know? So I, I think that stayed forever in Bluey, my husband Wung and my mind to make sure that if we are a multicultural, that the leadership, the board, the staff, and the people on stage leading worship represent who you are and where you're headed towards. I mean, like if you are intentional of picking the right leaders who are going to make decision about budget and, and the scheduling, you know, I think that was a good learning moment for me, like about 15 years ago. So um, because a lot of church claims we're multicultural and then you go and visit them and they're like, you see one Asian family, you know, so if you are going to the towards it or one black family, right? Uh, then you have to put your money and your calendar where you're claiming yourself to be, you know? So uh, the website again may say, we are a very multi multicultural church. And then somebody come and visit you and you're like, where are the Asian people? Where are the black people? You know, so um, I, I think leadership need to seriously think about this and maybe the pastor and the board need to think about where do you want to go? Uh, Thank you, Marguerite. Sure. That's, that's really helpful thinking about how if a church, if a person visits the church, like you were talking about and doesn't see themselves represented, um, mm -hmm. there's a barrier to connection immediately. Um, if, if that expectation that they have is kind of not met, you know, if there's an expectation of diversity or an expectation that, um, they would be at home there. So and that's really helpful. Thank what you. about the group that thinks they're multicultural and they're not in my home church in Southwest Illinois, I was teasing one of my aunts because we were talking and she said, well, we're multicultural. I said, auntie, you have one white man in this congregation of black people. That's not multicultural. That's either a visitor or somebody just wandered in and stayed. And she says, oh, don't talk about Brother Biddle. I'm like, I'm just saying, it's, it has to be more than one person that's different for you to say it's a multicultural church. I said, that's a good starting point, but you guys need to reach out to some other people. And this is connecting, right? It's about communication, whether we're communicate, communicating the truth, you know? If your church, I mean, like, uh, who's that guy who wrote on, it's blanking out. I read about five books for my doctoral. That guy who wrote about um, the lion and the lamb, uh, Reverend Katie, the, probably you were the one who suggested. So if your church is meant to be an ethnic church, you know, be that ethnic church, but don't right. claim to be something else, you know, because it's about telling the truth. Connection is about communication. And if we are not telling the truth, if we're not saying who we say we are, then we are investing in people that are never going to be a church member. And that's a waste of time and energy from the church too. So get the right people for your church. Eric Law, yes. <laughs> yeah, Eric Law, you know, uh, because there is a place for um, ethnic churches too, because there are a lot of ethnic people that does not feel belonging in a multicultural church, you know, and that's okay because God has created them that way. You know, if they're going to find ownership and leadership in an ethnic church, that's, that's, that should be okay. There's room for everybody at, in heaven, you know, so, but uh, we have this big idea of multicultural and we go crazy and then we start telling lies about ourselves. That's when we become inauthentic. Mm. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I I think that really speaks to that that whole thing around what connection means and who are you trying to connect to and mm -hmm. how effective can you be um in in connecting with different populations and is is it is it always designed to do that? Um, I, I like to lean into what I do very well, right? Instead of trying to present this thing, and it may be just a catchphrase thing that we 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 start using the word intercultural and you know intergenerational. And to your point, um, our website presence is very different from the experience that people have when they get there. Um, I, I don't know if it, if it's about looking at it and say, well, how many people does it take for you to be able to say that it's it's you know intercultural. 
you know, is it okay? Mm -hmm. You got this one, like you said, um, Reverend, one white person in there. Does that mean, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the numbers need to be for you to actually say that it's, um, but we find that not only in the, in the ministry setting, as I said, my HR hat flies on. I think about what that means, um, where we have to go out and work, uh, in trying to build, build people and build teams that are intercultural, intergenerational. And I think for me, it really, um, has to do with your ability to be effective to different groups. And it's okay to be, you know, to, to stay right here and you're like, here's, here's what I know. Here's who I can communicate effectively with. Here's who I can best serve and here, and, and to be okay with that, uh, rather than trying to portray this image, um, of something that, um, I, I don't do well. I, I just, you know, I'm not equipped to do it. I don't have the background experience or lens to do that well. And I think we have to be okay with that. Um, and again, for me, when I think about connection solutions, I think about that very deeply. Who am I effective in talking to? And who who can I, right? Instead of thinking, I got I to gotta try to reach the whole world. Am I able to? I don't know. But if I if I can just carve out this piece and say, here are the people that you know very well. You know what to, if you go over to a visitation, I love when you said my day has to end in rice. <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know what my day has to end in. Maybe hot sauce. I don't know. Let me just be cultural. <laughs> a little hot sauce, but you know, it, it is important. And it, I think it is, it is respectful um, to connect with people in the way that is going to be uh, of service to them. Um, right. and, and I, I, I thought about that. And again, many things that I have to do over here on this side of, of, of the bivocational piece lean into that. And it's helpful to me because we thought about that in terms of, um, the work that we do at the food bank, right. In making food pantries available to people, but we're, we're in a black neighborhood and we have cases and cases of bok choy and they're looking at it going, how do I cook that? Right. <laughs> or we took some other food over into some other communities and they're like, what did, you know, what am I doing with that? Am I connecting to anyone? No, I'm not. I'm over there preparing and serving and doing some things that, that serve me. So I think mm. for me, uh, ministry is the same way. And I think about that. What did I just prepare, you know, in sermon preparation? Was that some bok choy to people who don't eat that? You know? <laughs> Uh, was that some other thing that is not going to provide any, any connection? And what's my end game here in the connection? What am I trying to, um, address? Am I trying to address loneliness? Am I trying to con uh, address community? Am I trying to, uh, connect people with this deeper relationship with God? What, what am I doing? What am I serving? And so, uh, when I think about that, I think about it in terms of listening deeply and then also thinking about what is it that I'm equipped to do and what can I do well um, in order to uh, just kind of stay right here and be focused on uh, not thinking that it is my um, obligation or need to be able to be as broad as that. I'm okay with being able to stay right here and say, here's what I do well and I'm going to connect mm -hmm. here and carve my piece out and I'm going to partner with all of you to get everybody else. Right. We, we're not all called to be super Walmart. It's okay to be yeah. the corner grocery store. It is. We need, you know, to be that family owned corner grocery store for sure. All right. I'm, I'm looking, oh, Paul, go ahead. I did just want to say though, that, that, that if your community is becoming multicultural and yeah. that does happen churches become multicultural over time then then that that requires some some thinking and maybe even some rethinking about what your leadership is and 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 how you're going to live into that new direction if that's really? the direction you're going to go um and you know leadership matters right um and 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 margaret uh talked about um the ability to see, you know, yourself uh, represented. And, and one of the things that I'm, you know, particularly proud about, um, I guess, uh, you know, is uh, being part of Evergreen is that our staff is deeply representative of our region, right? We have myself, 
and then there's Reverend Doug Aviles Bernal, and then Reverend Sam Kim, and then Reverend Siobhan Walker, and we are the Evergreen staff. And, you know, we each represent one of the different caucuses. And that was not intentional in terms of we specifically set out to hire that specific person, but rather that God led the right people to be part of our community so that we could lead effectively, so that we could learn from one another, so that we'd have each other to rely on and and to kind of check each other sometimes because, you know, oh, this seems like a problem. Mm, that's actually just how my culture is. <laughs> you might just need to let that go. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. All right. We have, we have 10 minutes. Um, before we begin our closing remarks. And so I, I didn't give this prompt to the four panelists ahead of time. So it's a bit of a surprise, but it shouldn't be hard, I don't think. I'm going to give you each an opportunity in this 10 minutes. Um, tell a hopeful story. Tell us something hopeful about your ministry or you, the faith community that you're a part of. I want to make sure we've talked a lot about challenge I want to make sure that we talk about hope. So tell us a hopeful story. I was, uh, I mean, as we talk about intercultural, you know, um, I, I thought about intergenerational too, you know, I, I have a different take on intergenerational. And Maria, I saw your comments about young, young adults, uh, youth, you know, and so when, in terms of optics for going, in, we believe in intergenerational. So when you have, say, the older people worship team and the, the youth, one becomes uh, very old and one becomes, you know, that does not reflect our community. That does not reflect where we want to go. Young, oh, the worship's not as good, you know. So we are trying, experimenting. Why don't we go intergenerational? And in fact, that hits the point of discipleship. You know, um, so um, I believe there's a room for the ethnic church and there is room for that. But in terms of intergenerational, I think that's a command. We're supposed to pass down the faith. So there is no, no, I don't want to be intergenerational. Then you are, we are dying if we are not intentional about that. So, uh, so again, being mindful of who's up there, who are we discipling to be the future church leader, but that we're not throwing them up alone on the stage, you know? So, but the hopeful story is um, when pandemic hit uh, March of 2020, when we started closing down, I started in-person small group with my young professional October, 2020. So that was the earliest group uh, because Zoom, like we work 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the Tech Valley. We are, our work is about, we are on screen. So if you're calling us to do Bible study through screen we're not for it so i have to go very early with in-person bible study we just did six distance we ate together some of them sometimes i let them pick up meal from a house so meeting the needs where they are you know and so that's one thing that we haven't stopped meeting uh, probably not a lot lot of group we're meeting but knowing that young people we are not you know they are doing screen from morning to night uh, the youth are in school, uh, so we need to find a solution to that. So where is the need? You know, the where is the need of the people of your target audience? You know, if you're wanting to go young adult, and and again, reaching out to high schooler is different from young adult, and is different from young professionals. Uh, young professionals, I love it. They're already stable in their job, so I know that's the future of this church. That's why I didn't want to lose them. Uh, young adults, very hard. Uh, they are the uh, they are the depressed group, you know. Um, so knowing what's the need of the target audience, because we want to go intergenerational. That is the mandate to pass on the the mental, right? Um, so, you know, we as an organization, we do a lot of promo. Uh, the one thing I add, want to add from technology and ministry side is we do a lot of promo through uh, for Zoom and email on the on the website. But at some point when we want to have deep connection with them, that's when you need to go down the text level. That's when you need to go instant messaging because a group text is not going to work with this group, same as our older generation, because they just see as a group information. But when you say, hey, uh, Marie, you know, I'm thinking about you, that's personal. 
And young people need to know that somebody is thinking about them throughout the week because they need to connect because there are a lot of times with younger people. So probably they need a connection from a, from a, a, a leader, you know? And so I think we need to differentiate what kind of connection we need to go down and at what level. That's my closing. <laughs> Thank you. Who else has a hopeful story? I'll share a hopeful story. Um, awesome. I think the the whole place for me has been in um, where there was a lot of resistance to anything that had to do with connecting via any technology at the beginning. We were, some were kind of forced into it and um, being very intentional about teaching classes and sharing tools and all of those things. I, I saw a shift in people's comfort level in connecting that way. And um, the other success was in being able to marry that to a, a weekly uh, breaking of bread and still eating together. Even as the church grows, we've expanded that and we um, are intentional about still eating together every Sunday after service for those who want to participate in that. Um, and so for me, it's a success story because those who are comfortable and prefer to, to use technology we've been able to educate folks that they have a higher level of connection um folks who saw the benefit of uh, you know when we started out they're like i would never be on any social media platform i would never but some of the grandparents said i'm so happy that i i i, I did that and i took the class and I, i'm more comfortable because i see pictures of my grandchildren we live very far away and i i i'm able to see uh, a new baby where during the pandemic uh, months would go by almost maybe a year where folks didn't see a newborn baby in their family and they just you know, they lost that so um, a happy place a success place for me is those who have embraced uh, different ways of connection where before it was you know I felt like it was very uh, how can we get back to what we were doing before yeah um, and I liken that to folks who, if you think about 9-11, we're never going to be pre-9-11. No, right. The world changed dramatically forever. And I think in terms of connection and communication, the world has changed dramatically and we're not going back. So success for me is being able to bridge bridge, and, you know, kind of do a little bit of both worlds and make people more comfortable uh, with connecting in this new new environment, new world. Thank you. Yeah. Barbara L. Paul, do you have a word of hope? Uh, yeah. I have been in larger churches all my life, and I joined with True Faith, and I love it because, like she said, we eat every service, but it's more like a family, whereas before the larger church where I sat on the far right side, I could only see so far down the middle section and just one row of the, the far left side. But at True Faith, you know, you can look around and you know when somebody's not there because they sit there and you go, oh, what, where is this so-and-so today? You know, and, and it is like a family. And the benefit of that eating with each other every week that's how I came to know who people are and their names. I'm terrible with names. I remember faces, but, you know, the names like, oh, hi. But because I'm eating with them every week, I know, oh, hi, no, say hi, this one, that one. You know, and, and it really is like a family. I liken it to a first century church. And then when she told me the, the time they decided to organize as a church, they were studying the book of Acts. <laughs> that just blew my mind, but it's it's a, a very warm and embracing community of followers of Christ, and I love that. Thank you, Barbara. I know There's it's not no pressure, turn. Paul, but if you have a word of hope, you're welcome. I know it's not my <laughs> turn, but Barbara, you reminded me. So when I'm new to this country again, I had a hard time adjusting coffee time out of, after church, because I guess what I wanted after church? Christ. <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's awesome. 
one of the one of the things that I think was hardest for the Evergreen region during the pandemic was not being able to get together. We are a region that loves gathering. Um, and, you know, uh, when I say that, I mean that, you know, uh, it, at our annual meeting in Denver, it, the first in-person annual meeting since uh, since the pandemic, we had over 100 people there. I can think of other regions of uh, the ABC that might actually do something homicidal to achieve that kind of result. Um, <laughs> But um, but but that that connection, that being together in person, that 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 building of relationship, sitting down and breaking bread together, seeing people that you might only see a couple of times a year, that still meant something so profoundly. And and one of the things that that has come out of that recently is this acknowledgement that um, that for many of these churches, especially the ones who um are kind of in this rebuilding mode and everything there's something new uh breathing through them and and we're seeing um kind of a new generation and i'll, I'll say i'll use the term generation loosely because it's not an age group but oh. rather a new set of ministers who are being called to the point mm -hmm. where as a region we've acknowledged that and are getting behind and pushing to continue to help those people answer their calls this is going to be a group of ministers who it may be their 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 call as teenagers or coming out of college but for many of them second or third careers and they're still answering this call god is still calling people whatever the church mm -hmm. becomes next there will still be people to lead it um and and we're getting behind that and pushing and to me that's incredibly hopeful amen oh, that is the best god mm -hmm. is still calling yep. and people are still answering the call. And that's what we're all about here at Berkeley School of Theology. What a wonderful word of hope to finish our discussion. I am so honored and blessed that the four of you would join me in this conversation this evening. So my deep thanks um, to Vikia, Barbara, Paul, and Marguerite for giving your time um, on this extra day that you got, that you would choose to spend some hours with us, that you would share yourselves, um, not only in all the ways that you do in your lives and ministries, but also with the BST community. Thank you so very much. And now um, I'm going to invite the Dean, 